Father, we thank you for him, for the son that was sent because of your love. We thank you that while we trod this scene, we can also be comforted, encouraged, strengthened by knowing that he had trod this path before us. He went through it perfectly, serving the Father and serving his fellow men. And he did it apart from sin. He has done all things well. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for that example that we have to live by. But not only your example, but we have you as a living head that will guide us, steer us in the right path. So this afternoon, Lord, as we look into thy word, we pray that you may open our eyes, encourage us in each and a specific way, and further refine our direction and steer us so that we would have the right motives at heart and the right object in mind as well. We ask you to speak to us through thy uh, spirit. Amen. Amen. Colossians 3, a few verses in Colossians 3 I want to start with. And uh, for several months now, after starting this new job, um, I've had these, these verses in, uh, uh, in my drawer. I look at them every morning, and uh, it's been a tremendous encouragement to me. The verses uh, are in Colossians 3.22. Servants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inherit inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And that last verse, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. And I wanted to focus on that phrase, reward of the, inher of the inheritance. As I think about this verse, the other parts of it seem to be clear. And uh, you can, it's easy, easy to digest and absorb. But that particular phrase reward of the inheritance I was walking one day and thinking about this verse and I, I said Lord what you know why why this phrase knowing that of that you shall receive the reward of the inheritance why is this given in this passage why do you uh, to point to this particular phrase when it comes to servants there has to be a purpose. It's not by accident. So that's what I'd like to uh, kind of, hopefully we can open this up today uh, on, on, this, on this phrase. But uh, first of all, the servants here. Uh, literal, in the literal sense, the servant he's talking to is a bondman, a slave. Okay? And these are in those days, that's what we had. And they have specific instruction from the Lord on how to behave. Now, mind you, it's in the context also of wives and husbands and children, then servants, and lastly, the masters. Now, in each one of these, you'll notice that those who are in subjection are addressed first, like the wives. Submit yourselves. Children, obey your parents. Um, here, servants, obey your masters in all things. And then they, he talks, so the wives before the husbands. The servant is addressed before those who are in authority, the masters. So, clearly, the servant as a slave in that day 
was under authority. And uh, this, again, the literal sense is a slave bondman, but we can also apply that really today, today to employees and employers. This is an application of this principle. The servant is someone who is under authority, the guidance, the leadership of a master according to the flesh. So we can think of this uh, as, the, as, as our application for this, for this verse. So, what is the reward of the inheritance? Let's look at inheritance. And let's first look at what it is not. And I want to go here to a parable in Luke chapter 20. We can turn there. And uh, Luke chapter 20. The parable there, which we know is about the, the vineyard. In verse 9, Luke chapter 20, verse 9. Now, just to set this up, if you look at prior to this parable, it's important. If we look at uh, verse 1, chapter 20. And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people, Jesus, in the temple, and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders, and spake unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority doest thou these things? They were questioning his authority. By what authority doest thou these things? Or who is he that gave thee authority, this authority? And the setting up of this parable is that this is the Lord Jesus who came in Matthew as king in Luke, the son of man. He came from heaven and had authority from the Father. But there are people, there were the, the scribes, the Pharisees, rejected that authority. And in this case, were questioning his authority. And so, moves us into this parable. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. Verse 10. And at, that at, and at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then, then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. That the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. So here, the inheritance in Colossians 3 is not an earthly in in inheritance. This is the clearly, this is the other side of it, showing the heart of men, rejecting the son, and wanting to take from him the inheritance. He's the heir. And they were so occupied with earthly things that they wanted that inheritance, that possession for themselves. They want the vineyard and the fruit of it for themselves. So this is an earthly inheritance that an earthly minded person seeks. And in this case, those who rejected him, those who questioned his authority, those who rejected 
his authority, sought the earthly inheritance. That's what we have around us. The people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, who've rejected him, typically have one thing they are occupied with, is the earth and the fruit of it. Heaven is not in their mindset. But, but the people of God, the heavenly people, have a heavenly mindset. And that's why when we go back to Colossians 3, in the beginning of the chapter, to reinforce this thought, Paul describes to you and me, as the heavenly people, what our mindset should be. He gives us what our standing is and what our mindset should be as we dwell in a land that has, is, that, that has an exact opposite mindset. He says in chapter 3, Colossians, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, our standing is, we are crucified with him, we are risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above. That's how we should behave. Where God, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory then you will appear with Christ in glory when he returns. This is a future event. When Christ returns with the saints to rule over the earth, you and I will appear with him. Will appear with him. And sometimes this thought and the effect of this thought on our lives today uh, gets somehow pulled down to the earth because of our earthly occupation and attachments. The truth is there. It has always been. It always will be. But how the effect, the weight of it in our minds and in our lives, uh, sometimes it goes up and down by our spiritual state. And our, and, and, and our affections. Where are we setting those affections? So, the inheritance in Colossians 3, that verse we started with, is clearly not an earthly inheritance. So he's telling the servants to behave in such a way, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive an inheritance. That inheritance is not that we will get some kind of money or reward here on earth. It's clearly a heavenly one. And it's given to those servants, again, slave. A slave owned nothing. He was commanded, you do it. You do your duty. And it's, it's given to those who have little of the earthly inheritance. They have very, very little. Just the clothes they wear, and they go and work, work whatever the master tells them. But here, the, the promise to this servant is that he will receive the, the reward of the inheritance in heaven. There's a heavenly reward for that servant who owns very little here, if anything at all. You remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man had everything on this earth. And he had, when he died, he had the greatest funeral. But Lazarus, he ate the crumbs from his table. He had very little here. But look at when the change after death. After they both died, Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham, where, where the rich man was, was on, on the other side, was a huge gulf. He had everything on earth, but nothing. <coughs> in the afterlife. Let's go now to a parable again in Luke, chapter 19, to encourage us 
as servants uh, while we're in the scene. Luke chapter 19, and you know this parable quite well also. Verse 11, it's the parable of the ten pounds or the ten minas, right? So let's read it carefully and see how it applies to the reward of the inheritance as spoken to their servants. Verse 11 of Luke chapter 19. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Now, notice this phrase, the the kingdom of God shall appear. Um, and this is, this is important in view of how the servant should act out his service while here on earth. It has to be in the view of the Lord's coming. That's the only way you can be motivated in, and, and be thinking of that heavenly inheritance. So the same, the same kind of... Uh, uh, groundwork is set here in the, in the hearts of the disciples. They were anticipating the Lord's return. The view They had this view of the kingdom of God immediately appearing. He said, therefore, here's the parable, verse 12. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Verse 16. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast seen, because thou hast been faithful in, a very, in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required my own with, with usury or interest? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that had ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So in this, we, we need to notice several different people. First of all, the noble man is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he <clears throat> went into a far country. He went to heaven and to receive for himself a kingdom, but he's going to return to the earth. And then I, we want to notice the servants and the citizens, two different groups of people. There were ten servants, and then there were the citizens of the country. Now, the ten servants, the ten here is an important number because it's really the ten for uh, number 
given to human responsibility. Human responsibility. In the tithe, which was a tenth, man was responsible to give back a tenth of what the Lord gave him. The Ten Commandments, man was responsible under the law to keep the Ten Commandments. Ten servants was chosen by the Lord specifically to point out that there is human responsibility for what the Lord gave. One talent for each of the ten servants. Now, in this parable, there's no distinction about the different abilities, spiritual gifts. One talent across the board to each one of the servants. But there were also in this, in this parable the citizens. If you notice verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him. We will not have this man reign over us. Now the citizens are not the servants. There are ten servants. And in this scene there are citizens who reject the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again we have the idea and the reality that we live in a hostile environment with respect to the Lord Jesus Christ. They've rejected him. They don't want his authority over them. And yet we here as, Christ, as the Christians, ten Christians, have the um, responsibility to serve the Lord. Now, the word servant here is the same word in Greek that's used, servants, obey your master in all things in Colossians 3. These are bondmen, slaves, slaves to God. So, he tells them something here in verse uh, 13. Occupy till I come. Occupy. Now, Occupy here is uh, to busy oneself, to keep yourself busy in the trading and selling. That's what this means. Occupy till I come. Be occupied with the trading and selling. But of what? Of things that would be of, of earthly significance or have a heavenly significance. And so what the Lord gave in the the one pound, he gave that, we are to be trading it and making for the Lord gain on that. So, again, and we see this in verse 15. Why, do I, why, why is this, this uh, justified? And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded, the, he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So the Lord, when he gives you and me a pound across the board, he expects, he expects us to be trading it and to be making gain. How much have you gained by trading what the Lord has given you, servant of God? We see two wonderful responses. The first, he said, uh, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And the second also, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And the Lord's response really to both of them was, well, thou good servant. Well, well done, thou good servant. And this is really a very pleasant wouldn't, isn't it a pleasant uh, phrase to hear from the Lord's mouth? And if we can apply that to Colossians 3, as we're serving the Lord, can you project out into a future time when the Lord will reward you for your service here? And can you imagine in your mind that he will be saying these words to you one day? Well done. Well, thou good servant. And then ask yourself, in my service to the Lord, is, does it warrant this kind of response from him? Am I serving in such a way that I'm not occupied with the earthly things, 
but I'm serving the Lord and occupying myself with the heavenly things and I'm making gain for Him. I'm making gain for Him, not for myself. When, it, when we go back to Colossians 3 here, just a few of the, uh, the things that one can, just to be reminded, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service. We're not doing things so that our earthly master will see it and be happy with it. As men, we're not pl- men pleasers. We're not here to please men. But in singleness of heart. And it says later, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And then it says, for you serve the Lord Christ. When I go to my job outside of the home, is that the attitude of my service is I'm doing it for the Lord or am I doing it to please men am I doing my service when it's for the Lord with all my heart with all the ability the God given ability is that what I'm putting out why so that people will look at me in a good light no but I'm a servant of the Lord and I want them to see the Lord in what I, when I, what I do But first and foremost, I'm doing it for him. We're serving at a much higher level than just to an earthly master. Now, that doesn't mean disobey your master, no. But we are going way above this and we're serving the Lord. So the quality of our service is a heavenly quality rather than just an earthly quality. For you serve the Lord Christ. This kind of service will warrant well thou good servant well done from the Lord himself because we've done it unto him and we have not done it unto our men now outside the home how about inside the home the wife who's staying at home she also has this responsibility upon her to serve not just her husband and her children but to serve the Lord with and doing it heartily. There, I was reading a motto that one woman had in her kitchen. It said, uh, three divine services come out of this kitchen every day. Three divine services come out of this kitchen every day. She had that, you know, in her kitchen, obviously. But... When a woman, when a wife prepares a meal for the family, is it being done with that attitude in mind? That it's a service to the Lord. It's a whole different mindset, really. We take these things for granted. When I go to work and I'm doing what I need to do, am I doing it to get by, to impress men, or am I doing it as a service for the Lord? The quality of my service will determine the response from the Lord in that future day. The third one, he misunderstood who the Lord was. He didn't know who he was. Now, still he's a Christian. But he wrapped it up. He didn't do anything with it. And so the Lord takes that from him and gives it to that one that has already. doesn't make sense to the earthly mindset. But that's what the Lord does and he suffers he suffers loss there's no reward for him no reward for that Christian who takes what God has given him and does nothing with it now he's going to go to heaven because this is not the parable that talks about the unbeliever but these are these are Christians but no reward no reward whatsoever he gets by in 1 Corinthians 3. The fire burns everything off. But he gets by. He gets by. He has no reward, no crowns by which to put at the Lord's feet. Nothing. And so, the reward of the inheritance to the servant the reward knowing that of the Lord you shall receive 
the reward of the inheritance. Let's look at a few verses about the inheritance, beginning in Hebrews 1, verse 2. We read over this this morning. I just wanted to, to focus on one aspect of it. God who at sundry times, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, and in, time, and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. The Son is the heir of all things. That's, that's how the, he, he's the basis for anything that we would inherit. Why? Let's go to he, Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. In whom? In the Son, in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have obtained an inheritance. And uh, Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. There is a path of suffering here. He suffered while he was here. But the net result at the end, he is the heir. We are heirs in him, joint heirs with Christ. The quality of this inheritance, 1 Peter 1, 4. Verse 3, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible. The quality of the inheritance, this heavenly inheritance, is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved in heaven for the believer for the servants that carry out their service here in faithfulness and skillfulness making gain for the Lord while we are here waiting for his return Matthew 6 also just to contrast the quality of the inheritance there versus here Matthew 6 and I'm sure everyone here that can relate to this, but let's read it first. Lay not up, Matthew 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, homeowners, we know how every, every now and then something breaks down here. It's a leak here. There's, you got to fix this. you got to re redo this. Things over time of, a, of an earthly nature, they break down. They get corrupted. This is the nature of the earthly inheritance. But the heavenly, incorruptible, undefiled, it fadeth not like the, the paint on the car over time, snow, rain, all of that. That's the quality of the inheritance that is reserved for the believer in heaven. And every believer will have this inheritance. But... Going back to the servant, there are distinctions, there are grades, if you will, or degrees 
in terms of the good servant, the faithful servant, the skillful servant, with what the Lord has given him, occupy, and in the future time, there's a reward of, you get ten cities. And to you, five cities. Make sure. The reward to those servants was, yeah, ten cities, verse 17. Have authority over ten cities. And to the second one that gained five pounds, be thou also over five cities. So when the Lord appears, and we appear with him in glory, the millennium will be where the Lord and his saints reign over the earth. We are kings and priests. So we will reign with him. And when we reign over the earth, not, we're not going to be on the earth. Because the Israel, as the people of God, the remnant that come through the tribulation, they will be on the earth. They're the earthly people. But the church is the heavenly people. And those who serve the Lord well and faithfully will reign with him over ten cities and five cities and so forth. That's part of the reward for the believer's work today on earth. It has an effect, a consequence on on, on what on, 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 on the reign over, over the earth. And so that kind of coming back around now and as to the servant, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. And what that means to me, an application now, is when I'm serving, I'm under authority, working whatever, wherever the Lord will have me, I'm doing it first unto Him. Serve, you serve the Lord. I'm doing it heartily. I'm doing it not to please men. Because men waver. They change. And if they change, and I'm trying to do it for them, I'm going to have to change with them too. But when I do it for the Lord with a good conscience toward God and my fellow man, there's no change needed. Steadfastness. We're doing it for the Lord. And we are doing it in response to his command that we would occupy till he comes. So with what ability he has given me, there's a responsibility on my part to make gain for the Lord. And serving him at work and the home, there are ways where we can indeed be faithful, good servants, skillful servants, so that others may see Christ in us, in the way we're serving. And that produces fruit for the Lord. Amen.